Welcome everyone to another episode. Bodine Ledin joined by Sean Brewster. And today we're going to be talking about a really interesting blog that you wrote. And that is that it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Sean, tell us why this is the case. Well, firstly, uh, I was probably a little bit surprised by the amount of positive email responses I got to this one. It was something that sort of came up in conversation uh, from my mother-in-law, in fact, it sort of just sprouted off this quote uh, the week before. And I thought, huh, that's so true. And I've been sort of harping on about this as a concept for so long, but the, the phrase just sums it up really nicely. And it obviously connected with a lot of people because people are like, ah, that's right. You know, I've seen that play out in this business or with this clinician or with my own experience with patients. And it obviously rang true for a lot of people. So um, yeah, we thought we might have a bit of a chat about it on here and see if we can expand on it a little bit more and add a bit more color to this idea of, and it sounds like a fluffy idea, right? Like just be nice to people. And that's that's more important than being important to people or being important in a relationship or in an exchange. Um, but I think it's so true. Um, and I wrote about this in the blog, but it's, you know, it doesn't matter what the the sphere that you apply this to, whether it be everyday life interactions with family, friends, you know, colleagues, whether it be in business, whether it be in clinical practice, in the sporting field, um, it's just so true. Like we all, I think a lot of us naturally default to trying to work towards some sort of goal in our lives that puts us at a point where we can look up to ourselves and go, look at, look at this, look what I achieved. I've, I've worked my way up the corporate ladder. I've achieved the highest, you know, uh, accolade in my sporting activity. I'm, uh, I'm respected for my qualifications in the field of clinical practice these are all kind of external inputs that we measure ourselves against. And I think a lot of us fall in the trap of, of thinking that that's the important thing to focus on. Um, but people don't remember you for your, your qualifications or your trophies or your, or the wins ladders, wins on the ladder. It's uh, they'll remember you for the person that you are and the person that you've, and the way that you've interacted with them. And that's sort of where this idea came from. Yeah, we're we're very emotional creatures, aren't we? And and if if someone is nice, you will be more likely to be drawn to that person versus someone who's not nice. Even doesn't matter how important they are. Hundred percent. And like, you often get asked the question, like, who do you look up to? Like, who's your who's your um, you know your mentor, your idol? And I would and I'd sit there and I'd think and I'd maybe reel off two or three people that I look up to, and I say, what what do you look up to them about? And it's invariably I the words that come into my mind are he's a great guy. She's a great woman, like just a good person. And that's why I look up to them. It's not necessarily what they've done or achieved or the letters after their name that I think early days in your career and your sporting and, you know, sporting goals or whatever space we're applying this to, you might look to those things. Well, that's something to strive for. But the more time and experience you have in anything, the more you realize that the people who are the most valuable to us are the ones who are, put the most value into you. Like, you know, the people that value us, they're the ones that are the most valuable to us. So, and that's them being nice in a very generic sort of way of saying it. But, you know, you could you could say that in a lot of different ways, but it comes down to just being good people. I think that's the, the key thing here. Yeah, I mean, you look at a, a large corporate organisation, CEO at the middle of that, very important person, um, but can they interact well with everyone around them and, and make them feel important? Um, and that's what's really going to lift up the, their immediate team and the, and the company as a whole. Ideally, um, if they can be be nice to others and be genuine about that, um, I think that's what really builds relationships and 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 you know makes people feel good and, and want to work harder and, and uh, be involved. It's a great example. But- and, you know, that sort of makes them the most important person, doesn't it? Like we, we talk about the not important versus nice, but if you want to be important to a person or a group of people or an organisation or a team, then make yourself valuable to them. You know, it's not, and it, that valuable thing is not a measure of qualification and experience, you know, wins and ladder. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's value to the people around you. Make yourself more valuable to them by being a good person. I think that's, and I always think of this as a sporting example, like in tennis, right? There's, all these different personalities of people that have come and gone over the years. And we remember some of the, the tennis players from the early eighties and nineties and that were like these big personalities and you see them still around here and there, but the ones I think that are going to last the longest are the ones that have been genuinely good people and that people have admired, not because of their prowess on the tennis court. And I'm just using tennis as an example, but 
Roger Federer is a classic example of this. In fact, people have actually attributed this 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 quote. It's uh, nice to be important, or more important to be nice to him. I think I don't think it actually originated with him, but I've seen it applied to his name before because he is inarguably maybe the greatest tennis player that ever played. Maybe I think he's starting to get overtaken with some of his wins now, but he is he's you know incredibly good at what he does, and people look up to him, but. Not once I can think of an example where he lost his cool in an inappropriate way, behaved badly, developed a poor reputation for anything. He's just been a good human being all the way along. Like in all the interviews that he gives, he's genuine, he's kind, he's patient, um, and he's, you know, he loses. You can see he's a good loser just as, as he is a good winner. Um, and all of those little human interactions that he's had over the years has built his bank account as far as, value to other people people will you know if, if he's playing in a final you want to watch him play not because he, he's probably going to win because he's just a great person to watch and our own ash Barty, another example of that you know someone who hasn't been around as long as roger federer but she's someone that you like great person dedicated mum, amazing athlete all of these things you think well it's nice to be important but it's so much more important to be nice and especially if your goal is to stay in something for a long period of time as an athlete as a, as a business person, as a clinician, the thing that will give you longevity in that space is your value to the people around you. And it's not, you know, it's not your qualifications or your knowledge, like those things absolutely help. Um, but if you want to be known, remembered, leave a legacy uh, and to actually impact people, it's those things like how you are with people, um, not how you are on the tennis court or the soccer field or the business space or the, in the clinical room. It's, it's, um, it's how you are in those spaces, not what you do, that I think makes the, the lasting impression. Yeah, I think that can, uh, I mean, resonate with a lot of people in clinical practice and as business owners, right? Yeah, 100%. We, we, I uh, had a conversation via email with someone just a couple of days ago asking about why we, this, this is a very tangible example, why we don't do... Um, uh, dry needling webinars or, you know, online courses about dry needling. And Bo, you know exactly the reason we don't do that because we can't control the risk. Um, people could just watch it and learn to needle somebody maybe well, maybe not well. We don't know. We can't give them immediate feedback. They could go out and take those skills and hurt people. And I wrote back to this person explaining the, the mechanics of why we don't do it. And, and they emailed me back and said, Clearly, you've got really good ethics and morals around why you're making these decisions. It's not just about the dollars because you could you could sell tickets to that webinar and that course and people would buy it, no problem at all. And, and I thought to myself, well, yeah, you know, that wasn't the intention of the reason I gave you that answer. Um, but obviously, we care enough about the outcome of what we're producing in our educational material that we want people to get good and safe outcomes from that. And this person at least saw that as me in my answer being a good person, but it's really just a reflection of your ethics, your morals, your principles, and and what you hold to be philosophically important, I think. And you just take that idea and you apply it to just simply everything you do. And we, we trip up. We don't always get it right. We make mistakes, of course. Um, but I think like to my example before about like building credit in that bank account of, no, you've been a good person and made the right decision enough times that when you do make a mistake and trip up and and you're able to correct yourself, that everyone goes, fair enough, he's human, she's human, move on. But you make poor decisions enough time, your, your, bank, account, your bank account gets into debt, you make one more poor decision, and then you, you're emotionally and relationally uh, bankrupt at that point. There's no way, it's very difficult to come back from. So I think it's just about getting consistency in good ethical uh, interactions with people that really makes the big difference. Yeah, and it's really about that emotional connection as well. I mean, you could go to a GP, there's that many GPs out there, um, but what's going to make you go back to that GP again is is usually if they care and really try to understand your story and it's not just person after person, it's, it's really sort of trying to have some form of emotional connection there, building that rapport, building that, that trust, uh, and that's about being nice and genuinely caring about the person because absolutely they're all important they're all doing a fantastic job um but it's that other element as you often refer to that human element um and and putting that person front and center and, and really i guess getting to know them and, and being nice to them i think people, a lot of time people are quite busy people 
uh, as someone that doesn't need to be as nice. You know, they're like, oh, they, they're obviously very busy. I'll just be another number on their on their schedule for the day. That's okay. I'll, I'll just deal with the fact that um, they're a busy person, they're an important person. I'll just be rushing in and rushing out again. And I'll give you another really quick story. My uh, my mum broke her wrist twenty years ago, uh, and I remember going with her to the orthopedic surgeon follow up. consultation because I just wanted to hear and learn about you know what he was doing and how he was helping her and she'd been in quite a bit of pain and discomfort and we'd been waiting in the waiting room for well past uh, the appointment time we we're probably 45 minutes just sitting there waiting so he's really running late at this point he walked into the waiting room busy waiting room yelled out my mother's name without even looking up turned and walked back down the hallway and we looked at each other and went oh, I guess he's ready for us and so we jumped up and basically had to run after him down the hallway He was, by the time we got into the room, he was already sitting at his desk looking at his computer. No, welcome, come in. How are you going? Who's this? Is your son? Oh, nice, sit down. It was, he was clearly busy. That's how he perceived it. And I think at my tender age at that time, I didn't really recognize how big of a problem this kind of interaction was. And I walked out going, saying to my mum, like, geez, he didn't really have much time for us there, did he? I, I felt like we were a bit rushed. I didn't get to ask him any questions. You certainly didn't get to ask him any questions. And He, you know, wrote your prescription for some pain medication and referred you to the thing and off you went. Um, and it would have been so easy for him to just look up. Hi, welcome. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late today. Come on through. Thanks for your patience. Those small details in an interaction just build that bank account of trust and rapport with people. And it wouldn't have cost him any more time. It wouldn't have cost him any, you know, it wouldn't have eaten into the appointment time at all. Um, but it would have built so much more trust uh, and then, We would have then, I would have then probably referred people to him and said, hey, this guy's quite good, you know, based on my interaction, short interaction with him. But I left with a very bad taste in my mouth that day. Yeah, and I guess, you know, that that perception that, well, they must be really important, so I must be less important then. Yeah. And that's a, that's a problem. It sure is. Yeah. And, you know, busy people are often perceived as important, but sometimes they're just bad at time management. Like it just, it can just be a, a reflection of how they manage their time. It doesn't make them any more important. And we certainly shouldn't be applying that perception to health practitioners and, and vice versa. You know, we, it doesn't give us a uh, license to behave like that. You know, even if we are busy, if we're short on time, the last one had us running over, it doesn't mean that the next person that walks in the door is any less important. In fact, if you do a good job with them. They might be the patient that makes or breaks your business success over time. Like I could think of, I could think of a patient in the early days where I really put a lot of effort into it. And she was probably responsible for indirectly referring me maybe a hundred more people. And then those people referred. It was just, it expanded exponentially because one person had a good experience with me. I think we've all probably had patients like that, where if you look back through it, it multiplies out incredibly because of the effort and time and, you know, interest that you put into the patient in that one interaction it really does make a difference. And I know that you live by this rule because uh, you seem to just always have time. No matter how busy you are, you've always got time. And I guess it's, uh, you know, it's important because people then do feel like they can approach you and and, and ask you anything. And it's not, uh, um, I guess it's uh, not, uh, I guess, feeling like that we're invading on your time because you're readily available to give it. So um, I know that you do live by that. Thanks, bro. It, it, look, it's it's something that um, you know I, I do try to do, but there's a cost to that, of course, and it can eat into other things. And I think you, I think it's possible to do both really well uh, if you if you're cautious and intentional. Like you can be try to you can try to be available for the people around you that that you value. Um, like for me, it's the people I work with, and you know people that might need my help or advice at some point. I want to be available. I want to be a trusted source of information and guidance where possible, but. At the same time, there'll be times where I have to draw a line and say, actually, no, I don't have time at the moment. But again, that's only going to come off well if I'm, for the most part, generous and open and clear and kind. I think kindness and niceness are really the key, two key words here. You could replace that, um, that, that uh, the word nice and that phrase very easily with kindness. And if you do that enough times, then people are going to go, oh, actually, well, oh, fair enough, no problems. He's busy. Oh, you just tell me whenever you're free and I'll come and chat to you then. And it's, it's not like a power play thing. It's really just banking that credit of, of trust um, and, and, and being respectful for yourself as well. Like you can be too available. You can make yourself too available and then people can abuse that 
Uh, and so for the people who value you, value them in return. And for those who don't value, you don't have to interact with. It's as simple as that. That's some very important advice there. And, um, you know, as you mentioned a lot as well, it's always in the delivery of how you say that as well. And that's how it can be perceived as being nice or not nice as well. So um, it's not so just what you say. you say, it's how you say it. Mm. So true. Uh, you know, you could be delivering the worst news ever to a patient clinically, like, oh, you know, what you've got going on here is malignant and, you know, it's likely to cause you to die quite soon. You know, this is why I could never be a doctor, you know, or a, or a surgeon or, you know, someone that deals with that kind of stuff every day. We, we're, we're fortunate in musculoskeletal medicine that pretty much everything we do can have a positive outcome, pretty much everything, every time you can find some positive outcome for um, but, you know, sometimes you might say to them, you know, you've got this problem because of this thing. And sometimes those things are irreversible and they're quite difficult to overcome. But, but you and I were having a conversation about pain science before this, and it's just about how you phrase it. And you're trying to find opportunities for hope and positivity rather than focusing on the negative and, you know, this um, expanding outside of your very insular view of what's going on is almost always the key. Uh, and you can give somebody what would otherwise be perceived as bad or negative news um, with a glimmer of hope sometimes that goes, okay, this is what's going on, but ah, oh, here's an opportunity. What's the opportunity in this? Things don't happen to me. Things happen for me. And if I can find the four, then I know where to go with that. Uh, yeah. And that, so I'm just trying to bring it back to clinical practice because that's really, there's so many opportunities in, in our patient interactions where we can use these ideas to just make the biggest difference for their experience. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. There's some really great information there and hopefully um, many people can take something out of that um, because we know that it is important. It, well, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Sean, thank sure. you so much for your time. Yeah.